All right, so this seems to be working just fine. Uh, it's doing exactly what we want it to do. So um, let's now actually make the sky appear dark when it's nighttime. Um, and we, what we also need to do is we need to invert the colors of some of the sprites. Um, let me show you what I mean here. Let me open up the real game, the original game. All right, so in just a second, the game should switch to night mode. There we are. And as you can see, all of the sprites, not all of them actually, the moon and uh, the stars and clouds, they're actually still the same color. Um, or maybe they are inverted, but since um, their color value is probably um, 0.5 for all components, uh, it doesn't make a difference. That's probably it. Um, I guess also, I guess the score board also changes appearance yes it does so let me see i guess everything i guess we don't need to actually invert the colors of the sky objects because like i said they look exactly the same at least i think so um and it's probably like i said due to um their grayscale, grayscale value basically being uh, exactly in the center, so it doesn't really change anything if their sprite is inverted. Um, yeah, so this is what it kind of needs to look like at nighttime. We need to invert the color of the scoreboard, we need to invert the color of the game over screen, we need to invert the color of the obstacles, and we need to invert the color of the ground, and uh, obviously of the T-Rex character itself. And I think that's all of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's a very easy way to achieve this. Um, we could go ahead and create some sort of um, customized shader for that, and that would actually probably work. Um, but that's way too much effort, and we can achieve it in a much simpler way. Yeah, so let's um, go back into Visual Studio. And now, let's think about this for a second. Um, first of all, we need to use this normalized, oh, come on, yeah, change into the Sky Manager class here. Um, we need to use this normalized screen color value to basically calculate the, um, the background color of the screen. And we can achieve that in a very simple way. Um, let's maybe go ahead and enhance the um, this I day night cycle uh, interface a little bit. I'm going to right click it, go to definition, and let's go here and say um, color, which is a, a struct from the mono game framework. Here it's in the Microsoft XNA frame framework. In, uh, namespace. I'm going to add a using directive to that namespace and I'm going to say um, let's say clear color. And it's only going to have a getter. And now in the implementation of that interface which is the sky manager class um, we will need to actually implement this um, property. So let's go down here to the property section of the class. Let's say public color, um, clear color, and we can implement it in a very simple way. We're going to create a new instance of color. And I think there should be one constructor that will be very useful to us. Let me just see. Here, um, constructs an RGBA color from scalars presented presenting red, green, and blue values. Alpha value will be opaque. Uh, and I guess that's exact, exactly what we want. Um, so here we can pass the RGB component of the color, which indicates um, the factor of the of the red the red portion of the color, um, the green portion of the color, and the blue portion of the color. And if they are all the same value. Um, this, the color will be a grayscale color. So um, 
If they're all zero, the color will be um, black. And if they're all one, the color will be white. And we can use this and simply pass here the normalized screen color for all of the components, like this. So let's say um, this value is at 0 0.5. Uh, that would give us a color where the R, G, and B components are all 0 0.5, and that would give us a, a gray color. And there we go. And now we can use this clear color in our um, T-Rex runner game class to draw the background here. Currently, we just hard-coded it to white, um, but we no longer want to do that. Um, let's see. When do we actually initialize the sky manager? I guess we do it in the load content method, right? Yes. So maybe, hold on, here. Um, let's say if sky manager equals null, then we're going to stick with this implementation here. And otherwise, we're going to say graphics device clear and pass the return value of this new clear color property. There, as simple as that. And that should take care of well, the, um, the screen being rendered in the correct color or using the correct background color. But obviously we still need to invert the textures. But let's just make sure this works by testing it. And let me open up the game again and play until we've reached 700 points. And again, I will probably cut this part out so you don't have to sit through it. Hold on. Okay, so as you can see, the color is still white right now. But now it should kind of change to black as soon as we've reached 700 points. And there we go. Perfect. And it should change back at 950 points. Great, perfect. And it looks just fine. And I think the transition um, duration of two seconds is actually quite perfect. Um, maybe it could be a tad a bit slower, but I think it's all right. Yeah, but like I said, obviously we need to invert um, the color of some of the sprites, or maybe even all of them. Because if we take another look at the sky objects, I think they're actually too bright. Ah, oh, come on. At night time. And oh. Uh huh. Yeah, that obviously. Yeah, that's still a, that's still a little bug. Um, and I actually know what causes it. Um, if we're um, obviously zero is also divisible by seven hundred. So if we reset the game, um, we actually do transition to nighttime again. Uh, let's make sure this doesn't happen. Um, ba -ba -ba. Sky manager. Uh, first of all, let's go here and say if previous, no, I guess the problem is here that if we restart the game, the previous score value will be um, a score from the last run that we had. And then in the first update in the new run, uh, this condition might actually be true. Um, so yeah, let's maybe like make just make sure that um, first of all, if previous score is unequal, unequal to zero and previous score um, is lower than the current score. So this should get rid of um, 
that bug. So we need to make sure that the previous score is actually lower than the current score. And I guess also what we need to do is we need to transition back to daytime when we um, when we reset the game. So as soon as the user or the player clicks the reset button or the replay button, we need to actually transition back to daytime. So maybe um, I guess we can handle that here. We could say Yeah, we could we could go here and say if previous score is less than or oh no, not previous score. If scoreboard display score is less than um, the nighttime score, so if it's less than 700, and for some reason it's still nighttime, or we are transitioning to nighttime, we're going to reset those values. Um, Or actually, we're going to simply say transition to daytime. So I think this will take care of it. Um, I guess a way for us to test this would be to run into an obstacle at nighttime and then click the restart button. Then it should directly change back to daytime. Oh, whoops. Um, obviously, I need to put this in parentheses here because otherwise um, it will basically check um, if these two are true at the same time or it's currently transitioning to nighttime. Um, so obviously uh, make sure you put this these two conditions here these two uh, yeah just just put this in parentheses and it should fix the error so let me start it up again. Let's prepare to run into an obstacle. There. And now let's click this button and it changes back to daytime. Let's see if this let's see if this somehow messes with the rest of the logic. So let's make sure to reach 700 points again. Just a second. Okay, almost there. And it should now. Yeah, great. Oh, and you should also. You should also see now that the moon has a different sprite. Whoa. The moon has a different sprite every night. Yeah, there we go. Now it uses the full moon sprite. Perfect. Now let's actually invert the color of the sprites. Yeah, so um, in order to invert the texture colors, let's actually um, take a moment to take a look uh, to take a look at what that actually means. What does inverting a color uh, actually mean? Well, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, as you saw earlier, and you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, um, in the digital world, um, a very simple way to describe a color um, is simply by defining its RGBA components. R being red, G being green, B being blue, and A being the alpha channel. Um, alpha um, basically it basically defines uh, a transparency uh, in the in the texture, but we don't really have to um, deal with the alpha channel here. We're just going to focus on the RGB part. And um, whoops! And the color can be described just using three bytes: um, one for the R component, 
one for the B component, and oh sorry, one for the G component and one for the B component. And a byte, uh, as you may know, can have a value from zero up to 255. Um, or depending on the language or environment, it could be, um, be from uh, minus 128 uh, up to uh, 127, I guess. Um, but yeah, generally um, it is a value with one byte, uh, meaning eight bits, we can generate values from zero up to 255. And basically, um, if let's say R is set to 255, B, G is set to uh, 255, and B is also set to 255, that'll give us the color white. And if they're all set to zero, uh, it'll give us the color black. Um, and another way to describe this would be to simply use normalized values, like we did earlier. So instead of passing um, a value between 0 and 255, we would just pass a value betwe between 0 and 1, so that um, 0 0.5 would give us, if we, if we used 0 0.5 for all of the components, it would give us a, a gray color. And um, by uh, inverting the color would actually simply mean um, if, for example, let's say the R value, oh, sorry, the R component is currently at, let's say, Let's use the normalized values. Let's say it's, it's, point, uh, it's at point 0.6. Um, and inverting it would simply mean setting it to 1 minus 0 0.6, which would be 0.4. Um, and we ha just have to do that for all of the components. And in this particular instance, um, we need to exclude the alpha component. But if we, simple, if we simply do this, um, we can actually invert a color. And we need to do that for every pixel in the target texture. Um, let me see, did I actually? No, okay. So unfortunately for us, the Monogame framework doesn't actually provide a built-in method uh, that does this uh, inversion logic for us. But um, like I said, it's actually pretty simple. So let's go ahead and maybe create um, um, an extension method for the texture 2D class that uh, returns an inverted version of that same texture. Um, so for that, I guess we will have to create a new namespace because it doesn't really fit into the entities namespace, obviously. Um, I guess we could put it in the graphics namespace, but um, usually what I like to do is I keep extension methods in their own dedicated namespace. So I'm gonna go ahead here and add a new folder. I'm going to name it extensions. And then I'm going to add a new class. And it's going to be called, um, usually I go, when I, when I create extension methods, um, I usually use a naming convention there, um, which is the name of the class that I want to extend. Uh, and then simply the suffix ext for extension. You can name it whatever you want, but this is usually the convention that I that I stick with um, and an extension method needs to be declared in a public uh, not a public but a but a static class and it has to be a static method um, and it's going to return a new texture 2d from the Microsoft XNA framework graphics namespace so add make sure to add this using directive And uh, yeah, let's call it um, invert colors. And in order for this to be an extension method, we need to use the keyword this for the first um, parameter. And the first parameter has to be of the type that we want to extend. This. There. And really what all, um, I don't know if you're familiar with extension methods, but all there really are is, um, a glorified static method. Um, this um, syntax here, using the this keyword, simply allows us to, um, when, when we have um, an object of uh, this type, we can call this method uh, as if it was an instant, instance method uh, in this type, um, but it's actually just a static method 
uh, inside this in, inside this static class. So um, for the compiler, it wouldn't make a difference if we were to do this or do this. It's exactly the same. Semantically, it's the same. So yeah, this is really just um, to make the invert colors method look like it's an instance method of the texture to d class, but it's actually just a static helper method. So okay. Um, first of all, let's check if null was passed, because if that is the case, well, we can't really do anything. So I'm going to throw a new argument null exception and pass the name of the texture argument as the param name here. And yeah, we basically what we need to do is we need to get the pixel data of the texture um, and yeah, invert the colors of each pixel and then set the pixel data, pixel data of the new texture. Now, uh, the first thing that we want to do is create a new instance of texture. Let's name it result or something like that. Oops. Oh, texture to D, of course. Texture to D. And the constructor expects an instance of graphics device. And we can simply use the one from the original texture. And the width and the height will also be the same. So there. That'll be fine. And now we need to read out the pixel data um, in form of a color array. Um, and then we need to invert the color of each pixel and pass that or use that as the new pixel data for this new result texture. So um, what we're going to need is an array of colors and make sure to add the using directive micro, uh, to this new this namespace here, Microsoft XNA Framework. There we go. It's going to be an array and let's call it um, pixel data. Um, it's going to be a new array of colors and the size will be um, the texture width multiplied by the texture height, which will give us the exact number of pixels in the original texture. There we go. And now we need to obviously fill this pixel data array with the actual pixel data, the actual pixel colors. And we're going to do that using this set data, uh, sorry, get data method of the texture. And here we can simply pass the pixel data array. And this will set each element of the color array to the respective pixel color at that coordinate. So yeah, so now we have an array that contains all of the um, colors for each pixel. And now we need to invert those colors. Um, so let's say um, color array um, inverted pixel data equals pixel data dot we can use the select extension method from from the link namespace. You can do something like like this. There. Here. So what the select method does, um, basically it calls the function that we pass to it for each element in the collection and returns um, a new collection where 
the element value is uh, whatever we return in this function. So this function here is an an anonymous method um, written as a lambda expression. So we translate every pixel into a new color with where the uh, RGB components are inverted. Uh, and obviously the co compiler still complains and that is because select return uh, returns an I enumerable of colors, but we actually need an array. And we can simply use the extension method to array to cast the result to an actual array of colors. So, yeah, basically what we do here is we iterate over each element in the pixel data array, um, apply this function here to each element and return a new color for that, and then convert that to a new array. There we go. And now we can say result set data and pass this inverted pixel data array, and then simply return the result. And this should give us a new texture where all of the colors are inverted. All right, so before we do anything else now, let's actually make sure that this works. And I guess a simple way for us to do this is to simply um, call this method for the original sprite sheet and then just render the, the result to the screen. So let's go into the T-Rex runner game class here. And uh, I guess let's create a new field here. Private texture 2D. Let's name it inverted sprite sheet. And now let's go into the load content method down here. And somewhere here, we actually we load the texture. Let's go down here and say inverted sprite sheet equals sprite sheet texture dot uh, invert colors, and it's in our extensions namespace. So we need it to we need to add a using directive. So I could do that using IntelliSense, but for inexplicable reasons, I will now add this manually there. So. Need, you, know, you need to make sure that this using directive is added so that the extension method is actually found. And now I can simply call this invert colors method as if it was an instance method of the texture 2D class there. But I could also call it uh, like this and here it simply pass the texture. There. So now we have an inverted version of the sprite sheet so now let's just simply uh, render that to the screen. Uh, let's go down here, maybe, and obviously we will remove that later. Um, let's say sprite batch, oops, sprite batch draw and pass the inverted texture. Is there an overload that just uses, yeah. Pass a position, I guess we can just say vector to zero, and the color will be white. There. And now this should render the inverted version of the texture to the screen. At least I hope so. Uh, it does. Oh yeah, <laughs> but there's this um, white transition animation box uh, covering it. So let me jump here, there. Yeah, this is the inverted sprite sheet. Uh, and it kind of looks like the moon is not actually inverted in the original game. Because obviously if you invert it, uh, the color is just black. Or almost black. So I guess the moon, the color of the moon doesn't actually have to be inverted. And I guess neither does the color of the stars, nor the clouds. I guess 
all of the sky objects are completely um, unaffected of the of the inversion. Let me just here. Um, so here, this is actually still a gray color, which is probably um, exactly 0 0.5. Mm. And let's see, in our version here, if you were to use this, obviously this is way too dark. So yeah, I guess um, the moon and the stars and the clouds should be excluded from this inversion, which I guess makes things even easier there. But obviously our inversion logic works. So let's remove this here. And let's actually um, implement the logic for inverting the sprites of only the entities that actually, well, should have their um, graphics inverted. So how can we achieve this? Well, there are multiple ways, uh, as always. But um, I figured we could use an interface for that um, that uh, should be implemented by all of the classes um, that describe entities that are interested in this color inversion and should actually um, implement some logic for that. Um, so let's go here in the entities namespace, say add class, but actually that's a lie. I'm going to add a new interface. I guess let's call it um, I texture invertible. I guess. Um, yeah, this will do. Add. Let's make it public for no practical reason. <laughs> um, yeah. And it will simply have a method that doesn't return anything. And let's call it um, update texture. And we'll have one parameter of type texture2d. Make sure to add the using directive here. Um, so let's call it new texture. So at, so for um, with this, we basically have um, an interface that we can use to update the texture. We can pass the new texture that should be used. Um, and then the class that implements this interface will take care of the rest. Um, of the actual logic behind this. And uh, let's see. What classes actually need to implement this? Well, first of all, obviously, the T-Rex class. Most importantly, I guess. Uh, so let's go here and implement the interface. There. And now the compiler will say, hey, you're not actually implementing this interface correctly. So let's go here, say implement interface, and it will add a method stub down here. For this uh, update texture method, let's remove the throw expression and actually correctly implement the method. Um, so now some client, some, some other class will call this method and pass the new texture to use here and now we need to yeah, handle the logic. Um, what do we need to do? We need to update the texture in all of the sprites that the T-Rex uses, uh, which are I guess all of these. And I guess also of all the sprites in the sprite animation, uh, all of the different animations that it can use. But I guess that's it. So Let's do that. Uh, let's say, uh, idle sprite dot texture. Oh, it has a private setter. We cannot actually set this. That is a problem. Maybe we should change that. Or we could generate a new sprite that is completely identical to the original sprite, um, except for the texture. 
I guess we could do that. Or we may as well just simply make the setter of the texture uh, property here public. Yeah, what the heck? I guess we can just make it public. So let's remove this private uh, access modifier from the setter. Um, I guess we don't really have a reason to make this private anyway. I mean, it sort of makes sure that whoever uses the sprite doesn't um, change the texture to something that uh, where the coordinates are out of bounds or something like that. But I guess we would have to we would have to handle that um, that kind of logic um, anyway. Uh, for example, in the setter of the X and Y properties. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm overthinking this. So let's um, just keep the setter of the texture property of the sprite class um, public. That's fine. Um, so this way we're now actually able to change it. Let's go back into the T-Rex class and then say idle sprite texture equals new texture there. And we're going to have to do that for the other sprites as well. Um, whoops, there. Ah, I don't care about the constants. Maybe I should do this. Yeah, better. Uh, same for the dead sprite. Um, so blink animation. Yeah, for the animations, obviously, we need to do this for each of the sprites, each frame. So let's say um, for each. Um, sprite animation frame in this blink animation. Oh. Oh, we can't do that. Um, blink animation, uh, the sprite animation class doesn't implement the I enumerable interface, so we can't use it in the for each loop. Um, and we haven't actually implemented um, a way to get all frames I guess nah but we have we do have a method get frame where we can pass the index so I guess we can use a for loop uh, is there no frame count No, there's not. Okay, so let's maybe go into the sprite animation class real quick. And we have a couple of options here. We could either implement the I enumerable interface uh, here. Um, so that would make it possible to use the sprite animation in a for each loop. Or we could simply, um, simply since we already have an indexer to get the current, uh, the, the, the frame um, at the given index and also a method that does the same, we can simply have a method that, or a property that returns the number of frames in this animation. So maybe let's go here and say public int frame count, and it will simply return the number of frames in this animation. So let's go back into the T-Rex class and say there. So we use a for loop initialize the i variable with zero and as long as it's less than the number of frames in the animation we keep 
we keep uh, looping. And then we're going to say blink animation, uh, get frame, I, and set the texture of its sprite to the new texture. And we will have to do that for all of the animations. So let's do that for the duck animation there, and also for the run animation. There. So first we set the texture of each of the sprites that we use. I guess I can remove this. Um, we set the texture of each of the sprites to the new texture and then we loop over every frame in each animation that we use and also set the texture there to the new texture. And I guess this will be fine. Um, I guess we can already test this. Um, so let's go ahead and we need to call this method somewhere. And I guess the sky manager will be responsible for that since it keeps track of um, the day night cycle. So whenever we change to nighttime, oh, this doesn't make sense here. Since we decrease it, uh, it doesn't actually make sense to check for this condition. We need to, there, whoops, there. Um, yeah, and as soon as we um, reach the value um, 0 0.5, We need to call the uh, invert texture method or update texture method of each entity that implements this interface. So let's go here and say entity manager get entities of type i texture invertible. Um, yeah, and let's iterate over them. Like this. Oh, what's wrong here? All right. That doesn't work because we have a, um, we have a constraint on the type parameter and it only allows us to pass types that are derived from the iGame entity um, uh, interface, sorry. Uh, so I guess what we could do here is simply derive this interface from the iGame entity interface. So this should take care of that. So now this actually works. So for each texture invertible in get entities of type texture invertible, we want to call its update texture method and pass the new texture. And obviously we need a reference to the um, inverted texture here. So maybe let's add that to the constructor. Well, actually, Oh, no, let's just add it to the constructor. Oops. Like this. And then we're going to add a new field here and call it inverted sprite sheet. And we need to initialize this field in the constructor, obviously there, and then we can just pass it down here. Okay. This should be fine. Mm, yeah. 
Looks good. Mm, what else? I guess. Yeah, obviously we now need to um, adjust the constructor call in the T-Rex runner game class. So here, this will no longer work. No longer work. We need to actually pass the inverted sprite sheet as well. There. So this should work now. So now in the, where is it? Let me save this here. In the Sky Manager, um, when we update the transition and the um, normalized screen color um, is set to a value lower than 0 0.5, we iterate over all of the entities that implement this interface and then update their texture. And currently that is um, that will only be the T-Rex. All of the other entities uh, aren't currently implementing this interface. So yeah, but it should already work for the T-Rex if we've done everything correctly. So let me test this. So in the middle of the transition, you should see that the T-Rex's sprite gets inverted. <laughs> Whoops. Maybe we do need to in uh, invert the alpha channel. Uh, I guess we do. And obviously we need to also um, invert it back. Okay, so there's two things we need to take care of. First of all, let's go down here and say, if normalized screen color is greater than 0 0.5 or greater than or equal to 0 0.5, um, do the same thing. There. Maybe, maybe we should encapsulate this in a method. So let's remove this here and say private void invert all, or let's say um, let's just call it invert textures there. And we will call this method up here and also down here so that we don't have redundant code. Here, we're always passing the inverted sprite sheet, but obviously when we invert back, we need to um, pass the original one. So let's say here, um, let's just pass the texture here. And then when we change to nighttime, we pass the inverted one, and here we pass the original one there. Um, and here, in, uh, in the invert textures method, we simply pass the texture that we pass to the invert textures method. Almost at 700. Let's take a look at it now. Something's going on. It's really weird. Why would that be? So it does invert back, but... Huh. Oh... Yes, of course. If we invert all of the colors here, obviously that means that we also invert the background color. That means that it no longer matches the um, clear color. So no, it no longer matches the, the color that was defined as the transparent color. And that is a problem. We we shouldn't actually invert. I mean, here, here it looks like there is no background color, but obviously there is one. When we import this texture, I guess it just sets the background color to um, black. Um, and when we then invert the texture, the background color is obviously also inverted to white, um, which no longer matches the um, the color specified for transparency uh, and that's why it's no longer actually transparent um so let's see how we can fix this i think maybe there might be an easy fix for this ah i thought of a solution here i think um let us simply not invert the background and a way for us to do this would be um, I'm going to add a new 
um, parameter here of type nullable color. Let's say um, exclude exclude color. And by default, it will be set to null. So by default, it doesn't exclude any color from, ah, what's wrong with me? So by default, it wouldn't um, exclude any color from the inversion. Um, but we can specify a color which should not be inverted. Mm, and I guess here in the in this anonymous method here in this lambda expression, we could go um, exclude color has value and p equals exclude color then just return the pixel color as it is otherwise return the inverted color let's see if this helps now obviously if we um, just keep calling this method the way we do uh, nothing will change because exclude color will be null so let's go here um, find all references there so when we um, actually invert the texture. Let's pass an exclude color here. Nope. Ah, transparent black. That should be the one. Yep. So here all of the components are set to zero. Oh. What's wrong with that? It's obsolete. Use color transparent instead. Okay. Yeah, it's the same thing. This should help. So let's play until we've reached 700 points again. And here we go, the moment of truth. Yes, it does actually work. Perfect.